All right, today we're going to be talking about working in the music and or recording industry as a freelancer, regardless of whether you're an engineer, a producer, or a musician. My hope here is to share some information from different people's perspectives who work as freelancers in the music and recording industry. We'll cover different topics ranging from mixing to doing remote performances as a musician. We'll talk about negotiating rates. We'll talk about the logistics of files, transferring, as well as some good old fashioned do's and don'ts. If you guys like this, hit the like button, subscribe for more videos like this. All right, let's get into it. Do you have any lessons that you learned that you wish you knew beforehand? Acoustics matter so much. <laughs> so much uh we can buy you know our fancy eight thousand dollar speakers and put and put them in an environment where it, they might as well be these forty dollar speakers i mean yeah. it really is of little value to to us to have incredible speakers if we're not going to treat the surroundings that alone will make a massive impact on your room what about planning and like design stuff like what would you prioritize in the modern way of working a lot of us are doing wearing multiple hats so I, I, I kind of like the zone treatment. If you kind of have your room in sections, I think, I think the way our mind works, it's good to have exactly what you've got. Literally, like your snare drums are right beside your drum kit. Right? Yeah. You want to change that out, it's just right there. You don't have to walk over there to get your snare. It just makes sense to keep everything within reason. The more you have to think outside of that zone, um, I think the more detriment you're doing to whatever Focuses. you're trying yeah you're focusing on at that time what are some good practices sort of do's and don'ts that freelance musicians should consider the first thing that is a definite do <laughs> is get all of the details up front yeah you know get it all squared away like where is the gig or session or whatever what mm -hmm. time do you need me to be there and then show up early from that time I always bring more drums than I think I'll need. For instance, like sometimes they'll say, hey, do you have, uh, this has happened before. Hey, do you have a piccolo drum, a piccolo snare instead of whatever that is? Because sometimes people like to say that, like they don't actually, I could just crank the drum up really high and do that. Yeah. But if someone says, I want a piccolo and you go, you know, over prepare. Yeah, just over prepare. But I would say don't show up empty handed <laughs> sure. or, with, or with too little, you know, have the right equipment. I would say another don't would be don't bring your ego into a session. It's like the whole thing about time is money. That's a big thing in this in especially in the recording world. For instance, if you're doing an orchestral date and there's like literally 80 people in there and you're the one person in the session that's slowing everything down. That's think about you're paying 80 people to be there for like three to six to nine hours or whatever, if it's a whole day or something. <laughs> yeah. And you're the one person that's folding just because of your attitude, you know? Yeah. Um, so I would say a do is be willing to take criticism, you know, leaving your ego at the door and be able to change fast. Uh, you laid it out great. Uh, clear, get all the details, over prepare, show up early, be able to adapt, leave the ego at the door, and then uh, basically be never be the person who never who slows things down. <laughs> you want to? I I think it's great advice. Like as a musician or engineer, whatever. If your performance is making everyone else's job easier and you're nice all right switching gears here do you have any advice for when to send a finished mix how do you send it yeah and then like the i would say even the business side of it like do you give them a downloadable file mm -hmm. when you send them it's like especially if it's someone you haven't worked with yet and right. or whatever and you haven't been paid and should you get paid up front 50 50 whatever any advice in that sort of Mixer, you know, world. Yeah, I, I, I gotta say, I have been, I've heard horror stories uh, from yeah. friends, but I have been extremely fortunate on the payment thing. Yeah, that's um, great. So, um, I sometimes new clients uh, request half, half down, you know, before I start the mix, but I don't request it too early because 
what if I'm booked three weeks out? I, I don't want to take somebody's money yeah. too early because that puts me in an uncomfortable place when they are calling to check in on the mix. You know, they, and they, hey, dude, we've already given you three hundred dollars. You know, mm-hmm. like we want to see something. Um, so I I don't request a deposit until I'm about ready to start, and then um, yeah, payment. You know, as soon as I can get it on the back end. But I've had so so much good luck. I think I'm not jaded, if that makes sense. So I'm sure. not. I'm not really afraid. And I work with a lot of of the same people over and over, and labels and various things. So maybe that's it. But uh, because when you start working with labels and publishing company, when, when there's a when there's a um, a billing department and an invoice cycle, you have to be aware of the of that cycle and not be afraid to go ahead, you know, uh, and send the files off. For example, if you're only working with independent artists and you're used to getting a Venmo or a PayPal triggered right away because they're paying on their, and, and that's the agreement, yeah. you have to know that that's not the way it works in the corporate world of the music business. So don't get demandy on that kind of thing. When they say, you know, submit your, you know, send these to, uh, to mastering, uh, you know, send these files here, send these files there, print the stems, you know, and, and turn in an invoice, do, just do it because that's the way their world works. If you're like, no, I'm not going to send anything until I get paid, you're probably not going to work for that label or that producer again. So you can really hurt yourself because you're used to the independent world. Sure. That's how I handle the billing side. I, I kind of okay. I kind of shift depending on if it's a corporate or a returning customer versus a new customer, if that makes sense. The way I see it and the way a lot of my peers, colleagues, friends see it is <laughs> we're in the service industry. Yeah. Like I'm not playing on your song to put my stamp on it, my artistic sure. stamp on your song. Um, unless that's what you're wanting. Like if yeah. you if you want me to do my thing, as people say, then I will do that. But um we're in the service industry. So it's like whatever you need from me in the allotted amount of time. Like I try to make it like Okay. What you you live in you've lived in LA. It's probably the same way in Nashville. It's like you do a three hour session block. That's a standard mm-hmm. amount of time, you know, yep. for like a single session. Yep. So um usually it doesn't take anywhere near that long for one song. Um but sometimes every once in a while it does, but I'm always open to giving the client everything they need. So you would you would basically just say, We're gonna book by time blocks and then we'll get you whatever you need within that time. I try to say up front like it usually takes an hour and a half to two hours per song. Yeah. Unless you like want me to do a million percussion overdubs. Yeah. In which case it might take closer to three hours if just because I have to keep sure. if I have to reset up stuff. Um, you know, it just, it just takes longer. On the deliverables, at least yeah. early on. My, my default is still MP3s. I mean, technically, is there s- this much loss? Uh, yeah, but I'm not worried about it. They're still getting the, the vibe. Sure. But then, again, we have other clients that are very professional that have their own room like, like, like you. You know, like if you were sending me something to mix, you're going to want to hear it up here in your environment on your speakers. So I'll send those people the full resolution because they may want to drop it into their DAW, yeah. right? It, along with their mix prep session. So I'll send them a 2448 or 2496 or whatever the case may be, but only if it's requested, if that makes sense. Because I talk about that beforehand. On the revision side, do you give them expectations up front of like, hey, Yes, I'm not going to do ten revisions. Right. Yeah. That that's a, that's a really good one because he, l- let me give you a secret. Yeah. <laughs> the most experienced clients that you work with, okay. like the biggest clients that you work with, is like, wow, that guy is really successful, and um, they're the guys that listen to the mixes and go, "That's great, man. Print it." <laughs> you know, or it's like, "Can you give me? I want two versions. One with the vocal up, just a little bit more than that. Yeah. Great." Like, that's just the way it works. They know what they want. They know why they're hiring you. And yeah. um, then when you work for the guy that is, you know, Second you look project. it up on Spotify and there's nothing there. Yeah. And it's a hobby. Those are the people that are, are t- time killers because yeah. they don't 
it's it's not critical. They don't so, have to release it by a certain date. Uh, it's just fun. It's a fun process for them. So they'll, you know, well, hey, what if? And which eats clock. So yes, I think I have different rates, for example. Okay. You know what I mean? Of course. So if, if they're paying my lowest rate, you know, I, I'm going to go to V3. And, yeah. and will, I abs- will I go if they're like at V3 and they say, hey, man, I just heard it, 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 you know, in the car and the bass is a little a little too hot or something like that. I'll turn it down before I print the but file. But setting expectations. But setting an expectation is like, hey, we got to get this right, you know, like quick at my if if we're uh, doing my cheapest level. But then again, if it is premium price and it's an important product, important project, a repeat repeat client that yeah. you know, I mean, they're worth a lot of your your, your income a year. You do what you have to do and just try to keep your mouth shut even though you're getting frustrated. So definitely set an expectation level. Yeah, so I do it a little differently. I know some guys that ask for half up front. Yeah. I don't really do it that way. But what I will do is I will schedule a session with the client or whoever it is, the artist or the producer. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's both. So that they can both be at their computer listening via audio movers. Sure. While I'm tracking. Yeah. I don't like to do anything alone and then send it to them. And, and yeah. it, again, they like three days later go, hey, can we get one more take? Yeah. You know, in the rare case that that happens, I will try to foresee anything that they yeah. might want, any option they might want. I'll send a reference mix after the session and say, hey, here you go. This is what it's sounding like. Once you send me payment, I will send you a link to all the files. Got it. That's just how I do it. I just don't send any files till I get paid. If you're an audio engineer, producer, or musician, and you're doing freelancing, and you have to send files back and forth, I did a video uh, talking about this software app called Samply. It's great for transferring files. This topic is like one that's always been a little uh, loose and annoying for me personally, Um, but... Yeah, I just got set up with my Sampley account a couple months ago. I've used it on like nine, ten projects, and it's been awesome. I literally use it every day. I'll put a link to it. You can get a free account. It's free. Um, Down in the description, check it out. Also, I'll link that video that I made on exactly how to use it and some of the different features and stuff like that. What should you know going into a room? That's a biggie because you want to get hired again, and word spreads quick, you know, uh, of personality differences and traits and... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, and it can really hamper your career. Early on, when you're an intern, um, I know if you're in the room with whomever that's above you, and you want to impress them. I mean, that's our human nature, right? It's like, I want them to like me, I want them to respect me, and think I am on a such and such level, and, and that's going to be what helps get me back into the room, because they sure. know I'm a peer. And actually, nothing could be further from the truth. If you're going to get invited back into the room, it's just because you, in the early days, you were only helpful and not any kind of hindrance to the room. Some of it is low-level stuff like trash and sure. restocking the refrigerator and getting people coffee. But that's important stuff. Yeah. People see that as like, well, I don't, you know, I've got this degree from this university. That's yeah. above me. If that's above you, you don't belong here because, it, dude, I've been doing this 25 years full time. You know what? I just still do sometimes empty trash and take people coffee. I mean, it's not, a, it's not, I'm not above that. But when you're in the control room between doing those chores, keep your mouth shut and just observe. Never walk up to the assistant engineer or the engineer and, hey, there's a key, you know, there's a keyboard shortcut in front of the clients mm-hmm. trying to make them look inferior to you. Yeah. Never do it. There's a, there's a hierarchy in studios. The assistant engineer is there to make the lead engineer look good. That's our role. That's the role. The lead engineer is there to make the producer look good. The producer is there to make the artist look good. Don't overstep that. Know your role. Stay in your lane. We're all there for the same purpose. But I promise you, if you're still tape opping for other engineers and patching for them, for them, the more you kill that stuff and slay that stuff, the more it's going to help your career to where you get to move into that chair. Because if you do a good job for them, they're going to keep requesting you every time they go back to that studio. And then you're in the room with that producer 
who also gets to liking you, and the next thing you know, you you know, like you're 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 climbing the ladder. So your day will come, but um, just don't try to don't try too hard to get too far too quick. Uh, because it just turns people off. It really does. You have to know, like when you walk into a session and if people are being all business, don't be like the happy go lucky guy. Like, Hey guys, what's up? You know, yeah. other way around, if everyone is having a good time yeah, and it and things seem more relaxed, yeah. don't be like the Eeyore over in the corner. Here's my invoice. Yeah. Like don't, yeah, don't be <laughs> that way. But those little things go yeah. a long way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's great. That's just stuff that's helped me along the way. <laughs> All right. I hope you guys like this video. These are questions that I always wonder about, and I'm always curious to get perspective from other freelancers on how they deal with some of this stuff and how they like to work through it. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. If you have any questions in like on the freelancer topic and specifically in pro audio or even in freelance musician stuff. I'd love to hear what you think, or if you have your own answers to some of these questions, I'd love to see what you guys have to say down in the comments. I will get down there and reply to as many as I can. If you guys like this video, hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this. Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one. All right, bye.